here. I'm Dr. George Rutherford. I'm a professor of epidemiology and some other stuff uh, and uh, head of the Division of Infectious Disease and Global Epidemiology at the University of California, San Francisco. And it's a pleasure to welcome everyone here today to discuss uh, the latest on the SARS-CoV-2 uh, pandemic. I have no relevant financial relationships, um, nor uh, do the uh, planners or, re or reviewers and IAS USA has identified and resolved ahead of time any possible conflicts. Um, this is accredited for 1.25 uh, hours of, uh, of CME. Um, and the, uh, it's also been a, uh, approved for 1.25 hours of uh, ABIM maintenance of certification uh, points and a variety of other things. Uh, we have uh, we have generous uh, generous support from uh, from Gilead Sciences, Merck and Company, and uh, Vive Healthcare, and we'd also like to thank Janssen uh, Janssen Therapeutics. Sorry, sorry, Danish people. Um, so, just to start off, um, we'll start off a poll, and uh, Jose is kindly going to help me not screw this up. Uh, so, the separate window will show uh, the poll question. Choose your responses for the poll. Responses will be displayed after the poll closes. Uh, you submit your answers using the Q&A uh, button and you can use the chat uh, to discuss it with other attendees. So um, our learning objectives is at the end of the presentation, you'll be able to identify major new trends in the epidemiology of SARS-CoV-2 infection in the United States to identify trends in vaccination coverage and to compare performance of various vaccines available in the United States. So here's the first pretest uh, uh, question. Uh, to whom should I offer COVID-19 uh, vaccination? Please choose 10 micrograms Pfizer primary dose um, for uh, anyone between five and 11 years old, 30 micrograms of a Pfizer primary dose or booster for anyone five years old and older, but only if they have an underlying condition, 100 micrograms of a Moderna booster for anyone 18 years of age or older, or Johnson & Johnson or Janssen booster uh, only to those who've had an mRNA vaccine. We'll give you a second to vote here. Okay. Um, A few people avoided some traps. We'll we'll get to this a little bit. Uh, uh, we'll get to come back to the end. If an unboosted boosted vaccinated patient were planning to travel during the December holidays, where would you characterize the risk of exposure and hence the risk of breakthrough infection? I'm sorry. If an unboosted vaccinated and hence the risk of breakthrough infection to be the highest, Florida and the Gulf Coast, Southern California, the Upper Midwest, or Texas. It's interesting, I'm asked this question probably 10 times a day, but it's always about Europe. So I guess nobody travels domestically anymore. All righty. Ooh, interesting, 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 interesting. Okay, moving on. So, I gave my first lecture on COVID on March 7th, uh, 2020. And at that time, these are some slides from that lecture. Um, it is, was largely a Chinese phenomenon uh, with most of it in Hubei province, which is where the city of Wuhan is. Uh, it peaked around uh, the, uh, in um, uh, second, uh, second to third week of January uh, and then fell over time. This bump here was because of a change in case definition. And the orange is outside of Hubei and the blue is within Hubei. And you can see how, um, how concentrated it was in, in Hubei province, which is kind of a central city. Think of it like St. Louis. Um, but also during this period of time, as it was starting to appear elsewhere uh, in um, uh, uh, other parts of Asia, South Korea, Taiwan, um, uh, some in Japan, uh, and then in the Middle East, in Iran, which was one of the major portals of, of emergence of the, of the infection from China. And then finally, in, in Europe, with this huge surge, this is predominantly Italy. And that took off and went to the, you know, you can imagine, you know where that went. 
Interestingly, the cruise ship, the Diamond Princess, had enough cases that it showed up on this international chart at that point in time. So that's where it came from. And as we know, it's spread all over the world. Um, this is the most recent, um, interestingly, from the uh, Director of National Intelligence um, for the US. The Intelligence uh, Council assesses SARS CoV 2, and they try to come up with a thing. The bottom line is, this is it was most likely caused by natural exposure to an animal infected with it or a close progenitor uh, virus. So I think this is as close as we're going to get in the US uh, to acknowledging that this was, in, in fact, it, indeed, in fact, um, a, uh, a zoonotic event. So where do we stand now? So let's go over a little bit of the worldwide epidemiology. There have been uh, 262 million cases, uh, more than a quarter of a billion cases. Uh, there have been 500, uh, more than 5 million uh, total deaths. Uh, we're at a clip of about 4 million new cases a week, and it's going up. Uh, the death rate is thankfully going down somewhat, but it's still at almost 50,000 cases deaths per, uh, per week. You can see this huge amount in Europe, right here, this light, lighter green bar. Um, the US and the Americas are not blameless. We have a lot of stuff going on. But if you look down across this, um, the current, um, where the current uh, uh, cases have been, the US is running almost 600,000 cases a day in Germany, UK, France, Russia, Turkey, Poland, Netherlands, Czech, this is the Czech Republic and then Vietnam. Um, and so the surge in Europe, which is a big, big surge here, right, is driven by failure to vaccinate. And it's predominantly in Central and Eastern Europe uh, where there's there are large under vaccination rates. In other parts of the, of the continent, it's picking off unvaccinated populations. In the UK, for instance, we'll talk about this later. It's mostly unvaccinated adolescents and, and kids. Austria, um, jumping to the fore, mandated vaccination for everyone. A little unclear how that's going to be enforced. Uh, and then we have, as you all know, the emergence of, sorry, emergence of Omicron variant in Southern Africa, and it's spread to uh, Europe, the U.S., and other countries. We'll get to that in a second. Here in the U.S., uh, we are uh, surging. Uh, we had 28% um, increase in cases over the last 14 days an 18% increase in hospitalizations and a 13% uh, increase in death compared to uh, two weeks prior. Um, you can see this newest wave uh, starting to come up uh, here. Now it's not nearly as crazy as it was last year. Last year in, the, in this set five week period, we went from 80,000 to almost 200,000. Here we've gone from 74 to 110,000. Um, so it's a, it's a more modest increase by about you know, 80,000, um, but still it's pretty, um, it, you know, this could easily be a harbinger of things to come, which is why we're so worried about vaccination coverage, the emergence of Omicron and a few other things. In the US, only 60% of the entire population uh, is vaccinated. Uh, luckily we've managed to vaccinate 87% of people 65 and older. Vaccinations are, are uh, maldistributed in the U.S. and as a result, uh, transmissions maldistributed in the U.S. Some of these, uh, but some of these states uh, here in the upper Midwest are, um, are pretty well vaccinated. If you look at Massachusetts, 72%, um, Minnesota, 63%, California, not in the upper Midwest, obviously, 64 um, uh, Illinois at 62%, Michigan at uh, 55 New York at 69%. These are all pretty, you know, these are relatively high, high rates by U.S. standards. New York, I'm sorry, um, so, so, so Michigan is right about at the U.S. Uh, median, but it's not enough, even in a state like Massachusetts with 72% vaccination, it's not enough to hold this, uh, to hold this uh, down. So it suggests that um, transmission is a, um, uh, that, that herd immunity remains elusive, even at these sort of levels of in the 70s. Uh, we did a project with the, uh, Calif the other CDC, the California Department of Corrections, our own little inside joke, looking at where herd immunity occurred in the prisons during the early days of, uh, of uh, SARS-CoV-2. And it's not exactly herd immunity because they were trying to they move people around to try and 
avoid transmission, but it was all in the sort of high 70, low 80% uh, range. So it's probably something higher than we're able to achieve so far. We look at incidents by county uh, across the US. You can see most of the counties are pr pretty uh, high. This is their, the CDC's definition of, of, of high uh, 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 over time. Some of the Southern counties where there was a ton of infection this summer have a lot of naturally acquired in, uh, infection and they're holding the line against reinfection. And then out here in the Bay Area where, uh, where I'm talking from, there's been a lot of uh, push for vaccination and therefore incidence is pretty low uh, here as well. Uh, this is Ventura County just up from Los Angeles. And then Puerto Rico and Hawaii have done the best. It's, you know, it's being on an island is, is helpful. <laughs> Now this interestingly, um, this is a calculation that's done from uh, the, it's basically the risk for unvaccinated people. It's based on cases and test positivity rates. Uh, and you can see this uh, sort of swath that goes diagonally from the Southwest up into the uh, Northeast with a huge preponderance of risk here in the um, upper Midwest. You know, people, uh, so people who ask me are, you know, should I go to Florida? Should I go to you know visit my relatives in Detroit? You know, it's this is a pretty pretty big difference, right? Um, so, I think that this is uh, kind of where the infections are right now. This is where the test positivity is highest. This is where uh, transmission is going on, and this is where there's the greatest risk for unvaccinated people. Okay, so where are we going, and what can still uh, go wrong? Well, as we know, there's maldistribution of vaccine with substantial pockets of under immunization that can sustain epidemic transmission. So vaccination coverage is highly variable in the United States. Uh, and as you can see, we range from states like, um, you know, Ohio and Indiana with fewer than half of people vaccinated in most of the, in most of the South to states um, with more than 70, 60 to 70% of uh, people vaccinated. This is first dose, not, not total uh, vaccines. It's the only data CDC has. But if you remember, New Mexico had a lot of transmission. The upper Midwest had a lot of transmission. Okay, these guys you can understand, but the others are pretty well vaccinated. And it's a, it's a bit of a paradox that, um, that we're having um, outbreaks where there are relatively higher vaccination levels. But just remember that the problem is they're just not high enough. And if we look across about the protective effect of vaccination, this is something CDC puts out uh, that it by, this is this most recent data by uh, kind of the first week of October, <clears throat> cases were five times as likely, these are cases now, infections, diagnosed infections, were five times as likely in people who are unvaccinated than vaccinated. And a death was 13 times as likely between people who are vaccinated and people uh, who are unvaccinated. At this point in time, fully vaccinated did not include boosters. Okay, just, just, so just to give you an example of, of vaccine rollout in California, we're vaccinating everybody five years old and older. Uh, we have booster doses for 18 year olds, anybody 18 year olds and older. Um, we have almost 65% of the population fully vaccinated, 73% with more than one dose. You can see this big jump up in vaccines uh, being administered. This is all booster dosing and, and some pediatric dosing. Um, and it, it, this is all kind of Bay Area counties. That's, that's what's been blocked out here. And you can see what, how many are fully vaccinated. Marin County, which is the county across the Golden Gate, just directly north of San Francisco, they're pushing 80% of the entire population vaccinated. Okay, so that's one thing. The second thing is we can have the emergence of more transmissible and or less immunologically susceptible variants. So a variant is a group of this, uh, of this specific virus that share um, the same inherited set of distinctive mutations. Um, if enough mutations accumulate in a lineage, um, the virus may evolve um, and, and may be functionally different than others in that, um, in that same lineage. This is mostly about the spike protein. Uh, this, is the, this is the RNA uh, sequence. The spike proteins are here. And a lot of these mutations are occurring up here at the tip, the uh, uh, receptor binding domain, which is the part that binds to the uh, ACE2 receptor on um, respiratory epithelial uh, cells. Okay. 
Um, now, the spike protein, this is your factoid to learn. I should have asked you this in the pretest. Is 1,273 amino acids long, so it can accumulate a lot of mutations. Um, and uh, but it's there are relatively fewer amino acids that make up this binding site on the uh, at the receptor binding domain. So why do variants emerge? I think this is an important thing to to talk about a little bit. The the evolutionary burden on viruses is to reproduce more. Okay, the more progeny, the more successful you are the greater the niche you'll, op you'll um, occupy, the fitter you'll be compared to other, other uh, SARS-CoV-2 viruses. So um, how do you get that? How do you get more efficient reproduction? You, you become more transmissible. That is, you're more likely uh, to bind successfully to the receptor. Uh, you can also have longer shedding of the virus, uh, or you can have a better, greater avail uh, ability to evade the immune system. The other question is, and, and different variants have different, uh, different characteristics, but mostly the Delta variant, which is the one we're dealing with now, has greater transmissibility. There's some suggestion that the Omicron variant, which I'll discuss in a, in a little bit, uh, may have some, um, evol some uh, immune evasion uh, capacity. I think the other thing that's important is to talk about where variants emerge. Um, there is a uh, there are kind of two uh, potential schools of thought here. One is that they emerge from individual patients that have taken long, long time to clear viruses, um, clear their infections, and that because they're either partially or, or fully immunocompromised, probably partially immunocompromised is a better way to think about it. So that they're uh, so that the um, the virus is exposed to multiple uh, reproductive cycles. Um, in the face of a of a uh, of a, uh, a not fully robust uh, immune uh, reaction, um, and that gives them allows for the selection of some characteristics um, that may prevent a more robust immune reaction. The other thing, and this is somewhat worrisome, um, and this was very worrisome early on, was from a reverse zoonotic infection. That is, a human infected an animal. That an animal infected other animals and it went around in a circle and it started and it mutates in the animals like it mutates in the people. And then it finally after, you know, X weeks, it comes back to humans as a very, very different variant um, and infects the humans. That This was uh, a concern with mink uh, farmers in, in Denmark and um, other parts of the world uh, where uh, these, uh, these animals uh, became infected and then actually had episodotics. Um, and so that led to a widespread culling of, um, of minks in, those, uh, in, in some, some countries. Um, as you know, as you may remember, there was a case of the tigers in the Bronx Zoo uh, who got infected, were infected by one of the keepers. Um, and felines are, are susceptible to this, musculids are susceptible to this as well. Um, so, but I, there's no real kind of suggestion that the emergence of either Delta or Omicron had this reverse zoonotic infection uh, pathway, but it's something to bear in mind. Now, what are we dealing with? This is the US, orange here is Delta. Um, you can see from July on, it's been all Delta all the time. Uh, these are just Western West Coast data, uh, but, the, um, but you know we're still dealing with more than 99% of all isolates that are sequenced in the United States um, as being Delta. We're gonna have to see how this plays out going forward with Omicron and how much space Omicron will take up, uh, but um, so far, uh, no action. I think the other thing to, uh, to note is that the Delta variant has, uh, is, is much more infectious than the uh, original strain from, uh, from Wuhan. The strain from Wuhan, if they had a, say, they had a relative transmissibility of one, Delta is at 2.5. Um, there's some suggestion that Omicron is kind of close in, but, but worse than Delta. But just remember that if this is a, had an effective reproductive number of about three, three and a half to start with, um, that means that this is at least 7.5. Uh, for a uh, for a, 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 an effective reproductive number, 
which is on the order of chicken pox, just so to put this into uh, perspective. Okay, now on to South Africa and, and what is going on in South Africa? Well, there's been a spring surge, it's spring there, in cases from a baseline of about 200 cases a day to more than 2000 cases uh, per day. It's been centered in the Chwane district of Hautang province. This is where Pretoria is. It's about, I'd say 60 miles. I've driven it a bunch of times, um, northeast of Johannesburg, but Pretoria is the, uh, is the capital. Um, and here in Hautang province, um, again, including Johannesburg, you can see these uh, waves, the early ancestral wave, a beta wave, a delta wave, and now uh, presumably an Omicron wave, although not all of this is, uh, has been sequenced. Across South Africa, only 21% of the entire population has been fully vaccinated, so it's, a, it's quite a susceptible population. Um, and then Delta predominated in October, but this new variant, the, what we now call Omicron, came in, in in November and basically displaced it. Now, this is important because we usually look at these graphs that add to 100%. These are the actual numbers. And you can see that it's a relatively small contribution here of, uh, of Omicron variant, um, but there really isn't and much else going on. And that's seen perhaps more clearly here, where this blue here is the Omicron variant, the B11529. Okay. So um, this new variant was detected um, in South Africa. It has a high number of mutations, it's some 30 odd mutations, um, which are concerning both because they predict immune evasion and increased transmissibility. Um, there was, uh, it's been collected from a number of samples, you know, mostly from Southern Africa, and then subsequently from travelers. Um, it can be detected by, uh, because it's an S uh, gene deficient on PCR. Uh, so if you use one type of PCR, you can actually pick it up from the PCR without having to sequence, uh, or you have to confirm it, sequence to confirm it, but you get some early indication. Um, this is uh, their early diagnostic signs from diagnostic laboratories that it spread to other province, provinces, and um, they're now pushing much harder on vaccination. But here, when you use these charts that add up to 100%, you can see how it's really starting to displace uh, the Delta variant, which is concerning. Although, again, these are based on very, very small numbers. Okay. This is a very interesting letter from Angelique Kutzi, who's the president of the South African Medical Association, published last Friday. And she's talking about her patients. Most of them are seeing, or their members, most of them are seeing very, very mild symptoms. And none of them so far have, have admitted patients to surgeries. We've been able to treat these patients conservatively at home. Fascinatingly, there was no reported loss of taste or smell. There was no major drop in O2 saturation. All were under 40 years of age and half were vaccinated. At the same time, she reported um, that there's been a, a surge in respiratory illness and admissions in younger children under two. Um, children under two now admit, account for 10% of all admissions in Hautung province. Um, and children under five had the second highest admission rate per age group after people 60 and over. Yeah, but it was not clear at all, and it's still not clear if it's SARS-CoV-2, either Delta or Omicron, influenza, or even RSV. There's a worldwide epidemic of RSV uh, that's been going on. Um, and my money says that this is RSV, but it, to, be, uh, to be determined. Now, that's great evidence you know, in an editorial in Reuters. Um, but actually, this came out today, 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 before this meeting. Um, and this is a case series of 42 patients uh, from the Steve Biko Shawani District Hospital Complex in Pretoria. Uh, these are all patients with Omicron or presumed Omicron. Um, and uh, if you look at vaccinated versus unvaccinated, uh, 24 of the uh, 24 were uh, unvaccinated, eight were unknown. Uh, six were vaccinated, and there are another four kids uh, who are not eligible. Uh, two of the vaccinated were on oxygen, uh, 10 of the unvaccinated, and two of the unknowns um, were on, uh, on, uh, on oxygen. Um, so overall, if you look at oxygen for COVID, 
only 21% of patients were on, uh, were on uh, oxygen, uh, required oxygen. So there's some other five here who had other diseases. Um, but here, there are four pediatric patients, which is not 10% of the, of the, uh, of the admission. So, um, you know, so at least here in this first, um, first iteration, I guess it's four out of 42, I guess it is 10%, sorry. Um, so it is, you know, it's, it's not, not small, but at least one of these patients was on high flow nasal oxygen. And there's a single patient that's intubated. Okay. So that's one out of 42 that's intubated in the hospital. So that's, and, and their impression as it goes out through all of this is that this is a milder disease. The other thing that's come out of South Africa, and this is now in med archives, um, is that, uh, that reinfection may be more common. Um, and if you look at primary infections and reinfections, you can see the spike of reinfections that's starting here in November and going into December. This corresponds with the Omicron surge um, and is quite a bit different um, than what was seen in other, um, other prior uh, surges. So there's some concern that Omicron may confer less naturally acquired immunity or be less, uh, uh, have less kind of uh, pluripotentiality for, um, for vaccination and cross protection for, vac um, for, um, uh, for reinfection. Again, very, very preliminary. Okay, so what have we done in response to Omicron? Uh, WHO uh, classified it as a variant of concern. US closed uh, tr travel from Southern Africa. President Biden, which probably is going to be lifted here pretty quickly because it's not doing anything anymore. President Biden announced a winter pandemic strategy on December 2nd. Um, you have to test negative within 24 hours, uh, either PCR or antigens uh, before departure to, to the US. Also pushing home uh, at home tests um, and these require those to be reimbursable by individuals insurance, although I can tell he hasn't been filling out insurance claims lately if he thinks this makes it easier. Uh, they're setting up mobile family vaccination sites. Um, they're really pushing antigen testing now, which I think it's about time um, and promoting uh, boosters. Um, and again, the old mantra is that vaccination will limit the emergence of variants. As you all know, we've had several isolates in the US. The first was in San Francisco in a traveler from South Africa that will return two days before this travel, before this was even recognized and seven days before the travel ban went into effect. So you can see how porous these things are. Another was in Minnesota um, who had no international travel experience, but had been at an anime conference or convention at uh, Javits Center in New York City. And now that's recognized that there are um, uh, at least a dozen cases from there that there's probably some kind of super spreading event that went on there. We have other Omicron isolates um, and they're showing up in other parts of the uh, other parts of the world as well. All right, so what's the third thing that can go wrong? We can lose confidence in vaccines and get more vaccine hesitancy. These are the latest data on vaccine hesit hesitancy. 16% say no way, no how uh, in the US. Um, even now, 5% of people saying they wanna wait and see how well it works, um, which is you know, 18 months into this, it's sort of, no, not 18 months, uh, 10, 11 months into this with more than 200 million people vaccinated, it's sort of crazy. Um, and then there are a small margin that's probably gonna have to be forced into getting vaccinated. So remember the 16% here, okay? If you look at 12 to 17 year olds, um, uh, Thirty-one uh, percent say definitely not, and for uh, five to eleven-year-olds, thirty percent of parents say uh, definitely not. There's a lot of waiting and seeing in this uh, in this group, and nationwide we see low levels of uh, uptake in five to eleven-year-olds. Um, luckily, in the Bay Area, we're having pretty high uptake, uh, at least for first doses, um, and in at least one county, Marin County, again. Um, it's pushing 50% of uh, five to 11 year olds have gotten at least a first dose. So I think it's important to reiterate uh, kind of one of the basic tenets of vaccine preventable disease epidemiology. The reasons we have incident out outbreaks of incident vaccine preventable diseases is from failure to vaccinate. Okay, it's not from vaccine failure, it's from failure to vaccinate. And you're seeing that in Europe now um, with lots and lots of transmission in less well-vaccinated countries. 
after that, then you can move into maybe it's vaccine failure. Vaccine failure is, can be through mishandling. Remember, there's a pretty brutal cold chain requirement for the mRNA vaccines. You can give them to people who are immunocompromised, either from disease or from therapeutics. You can have genetic drift um, uh, where the vaccines work less well through immune evasion. And then you can just have general waning immunity um, for whatever reason. A uh, part of this is that people aren't getting re-stimulated uh, by uh, continuous exposure. The part of it may be that the, we vaccinated people too closely together, gave the doses too closely together and didn't kind of get that big lasting bump, um, which we're now getting from the, uh, from the booster doses. And uh, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about, um, here we're looking at after 120 days, the calculated vaccine effectiveness for Moderna is 92%, for Pfizer is 77%, and for J&J &J is 68%. Uh, uh, 68%. This is held up in a number of studies, and in fact, the numbers are, even the VA study are dramatically lower, but that was done a little bit later, but it's still of that order of magnitude. So in, in, um, in response to this, FDA, CDC authorized booster doses for everyone 18 years of, of age and older um, within, uh, who've had uh, or six months or more out from their second mRNA dose or two months or more out from their single J&J &J, um, dose. Boosting goes with a half dose of 50, mics, uh, 50 micrograms of Moderna or a full dose, 30 micrograms of Pfizer. Now, one of the things that comes up is why, what's going on in the UK? Um, and is that a harbinger of things to come for us? Um, new cases um, are, uh, are perking along at about 75% of their winter peak from last year, but hospitalizations and deaths are, are lower. Um, the Delta variant, um, uh, uh, a, a newer Delta variant, a subvariant, um, Compromise, comprises 6.9% uh, of UK isolates, but it's not necessarily linked to the surge. It's more of a curiosity. Probably more of the bigger deal was that all legal restrictions were lifted on July 9th, 19th. And you can see things just went right, right back up again. Here, school children in the UK, not here, in the UK, school children are driving it uh, with, um, uh, with driving the surge with a third of the cases in children under 15 years of age. And there's now a new campaign to vaccinate 12 to 15 year olds. Here, this is um, um, this is going up. Uh, you can see in 10 to 14 year olds, five to nine year olds, and um, and it went up and down in uh, 15 to 19 year olds. And then, of course, when it goes up in this age group, it goes up in this age group because the parents are seeing it as well. And the day I put this slide together, this kicked up. This came in the Los Angeles Times that unvaccinated teens were driving infection rates in Los Angeles County. And you say, well, how could that possibly be, be true? Um, but if you look at the data, this is vaccine coverage in Los Angeles and San Francisco counties, our favorite compare and contrast. Um, you can see here that 87% of, of uh, 12 to 17 year olds are vaccinated and fully vaccinated in San Francisco, as opposed to 65% in Los Angeles at least 25% unvaccinated out here versus, this is less than 10%. Um, and so you can see that you could sustain transmission uh, with this group and, and, and this group much more easily than with this, you know, these fewer numbers here. So I'm not at all unconvinced uh, that um, this isn't true, that adolescents are driving some of the surge in Los Angeles. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the data have come from Israel. Uh, that we follow. Um, and uh, they've also evaluated the, eff the effectiveness of booster doses. Um, so they get, um, uh, so they're comparing two doses to three doses here. This is um, hospitals, this is severe disease, this is death. Uh, the vaccine effectiveness is 83% for infection, 95% for hospitalization, <clears throat> and 80% for death compared to two doses. So that's pretty favorable. Again, these were key data in pushing the de decision to, to vaccinate. The other study that was done, which I thought was really interesting, was a, 
uh, basically a neutralizing antibody titer study, you know, of course, ignoring um, cellular immunity. But this is, starts with the primary series, J&J, &J, Moderna, or Pfizer, okay, same, and then looked at three different boosters. So if you got, for instance, J&J &J and that got Moderna, this is with twice the dose we're using, actually. Um, the, the geometric mean titer rise was 75.9. If you got J&J &J and got J&J, &J, it went up 4.2. And if you got J&J &J and got Pfizer, it went up 35.1. Again, this is double the dose. Um, there was something about people who got uh, Moderna and then J&J &J boosters uh, going way up uh, that came out in the paper yesterday, uh, but it's not that much in this study. So anyway, I think this is, you know, I think the point here is, is that at least in my eyes, is that if people got uh, a J and J vaccine, they should be getting a, uh, an mRNA booster. Okay, third doses have been recommended since August for people who are less likely to develop immunity after a primary series, solid organ transplant recipients, severely immunosuppressed, and people on hemodialysis. That's still that still leaves forty percent of people in these groups un, un, unprotected. And I think we'll keep seeing them getting vaccinated over and over and over again. Um, and I kind of went over this stuff already. Okay. And then um, pediatric vaccines have now been approved and being administered to five to 11 year olds. This is my 11 year old uh, granddaughter. It looks like a veterinarian's office. I told her it's a drugstore, but Pfizer gets a 10 microgram dose, which is a third of the adult dose. Um, and um, the next steps is that FDA is gonna consider an EUA for Moderna for five to 17 year olds. The new authorization for two, two to four year olds and then down the line, seven to 23 month olds um, is going to be happening uh, probably in the first quarter of the year. What else is going on? What else could go wrong? We can underutilize existing technologies. Now, I I'm really do epidemiology and public health, so I'm not in the hospital trying to take care of these patients, but read the literature. Um, there are several things that are gone on. Uh, their Regeneron um, uh, uh, monoclonal antibody uh, combination has proven to be uh, quite effective um, in, um, um, uh, in patients with symptomatic um, infection. Um, the um, uh, Merck has put out this new drug called Molnupiravir, which has now been approved by or been authorized by FDA. Um, it was at the time was said to be 50% effective, it's closer to 30%. The U.S. has bought into this fully, and we're ordering all this stuff, um, and we'll see what else comes up. But there have also been trials with similar data from for remdesivir, and then Pfizer looks like they knocked the uh, ball out of the park with a new drug called Paxlovid, um, which these are all antivirals as opposed to mon uh, as opposed to uh, monoclonal antibodies. The problem with monoclonal antibodies is, is these variants sort of shift around. Um, it's not at all clear that how well these are going to work. This stuff should work, however. And then finally, we ignore the international spread at our peril. Uh, the U.S. has done quite a bit uh, on this uh, in this area, but not nearly enough. South Africa has a population of 60 million, and you know we've given them, you know, however many doses we've given them, um, but it's hardly 60 million. Um, and we need to be, uh, I think we need to redouble down uh, on our efforts to try and um, vaccinate people in highly populated countries, especially those with a lot of HIV infection like India and South Africa, um, and potentially Brazil, or at least uncontrolled HIV infection, uh, because that's one of the big breeding grounds for, uh, uh, for um, uh, uh, resistant var for variants. So what have we learned and what we, will we do differently next time? Well, I think there are a handful of, of, of lessons. First is that early warning systems are key with a focus on human animal interfaces. Um, this is called the One Health Approach, pioneered by the um, University of California Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. <clears throat> Internationalism is absolutely positively essential. Um, we need to employ private sector solutions for manufacturing and distributing early prototype diagnostic and screening tests, <clears throat> CDC trying to control the flow and the supply of these uh, reagents early on set us back several weeks. Um, the problem that was not did not happen in Europe. We need to strengthen domestic and global health architecture for planning 
pandemic preparedness and response. There's a framework convention that the World Health Assembly um, uh, uh, <clears throat> endorsed uh, last week in, in Geneva. The World Health Assembly is like the General Assembly is for the UN, for, the, uh, for WHO, uh, which is to try and redo this whole architecture around planning pre pandemic preparedness and response. And then in the United States, for sure, we need to reinvest in public health and rebuild the public health infrastructure, which has been stripped uh, bare over the last umpteen years. So in summary, as with any vaccine preventable diseases, the primary reason for incident cases is failure to vaccinate. And counties and states and countries for that matter with the highest incidence often have the lowest immunity uh, with both natural plus vaccine acquired immunity. How well natural acquired immunity will stand up with, with, Delta, with the Omicron is kind of an open question right now. Breakthroughs remain, re, remain rare, although given the number of people who are vaccinated, it will seem quite common in your practices. Uh, we're, uh, I think we're likely already seeing the start of a winter surge in the US and how bad it will be. <clears throat> it will depend on Delta versus Omicron. If Omicron is really less, um, causes less severe disease and is more transmissible than Delta, that might be a really good news Christmas present. Right. We're going to squeeze out Delta, bad Delta, replace it with pretty, you know, pretty uh, milk toast uh, Omicron. And, um, you know, the hospitals remain relatively open. Um, and while people, we may have a lot of cases, they're not particularly going to get particularly sick. As Bob Wachter, who's the chair of medicine uh, here at UCSF, has described that, that scenario as a Hallmark card, <laughs> um, as a Hallmark card scenario. And I, it's probably too good to be true. I think you have to really stay tuned and it's far too early to act on that. We have the problem of waning immunity versus boosters. I think this is far more important than this little battle going on here. And uh, we're gonna have to get the population boosted. Then we're gonna have to move into adolescents and kids to get them boosted. So we essentially have a 016 uh, vaccination schedule for the mRNA vaccines. That's what's gonna hold the line for us. Uh, we have to see how the vaccination mandates play out. As you know, they're being legally challenged. There was a fascinating article um, last week and it's either in JAM or the New England Journal that looked at all the legal, um, uh, at all the legal uh, uh, interventions that have been enacted in the United States around trying to control the epidemic. And something like more than 90% of them are about things you can't do. Like you can't do this and you can't band-aid vaccines and you can't mandate masks and, you know, all this stuff about, you know, it's individual liberty trumps disease control. And then finally, we're going to have to see what happens with the coverage of 5 to 11 and 12 to 17 year olds. They'll remain important in the epidemiology and transmission of the disease, especially older kids. And then we have potential for influenza A, not really realized yet, and RSV syndemics. RSV, I think, is particularly uh, problematic um, for younger children. So, um, um, so, okay, so let's move on. All right. So to whom should I offer COVID-19 vaccination? Take it away. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, good call. Um, the Moderna booster is 50 micrograms, by the way. That's what the problem, that's the trick part of that one. Um, to whom should I offer COVID-19 vaccination? Uh, only, for the, only the Pfizer series is available for children and adolescents. Children less than 12 receive 10 mics. Those 12 to 17 get 30 mics. The Moderna booster is 50 mics and J&J &J can be boosted with anything. All right, if an unboosted vaccinated person were planning to travel during December holidays, uh, where would you characterize the risk of exposure and hence the risk of breakthrough infection to be the highest? Again, unboosted but vaccinated patient. One choice.
Okay. The upper Midwest is the right answer. Very good. Okay. Terrific. Well, it's been a pleasure to talk to everyone. Um, and I'm going to pull up the Q&A things here. Um, so uh, Ron Valdeseri, whom I used to work with at, at CDC, says, do you really mean maldistribution of vaccine or maldistribution of vaccination? That's a, that's a fair point, Ron. Um, it's uh, maldistribution of vaccination rather than the federal government passes out vaccine. They try and get the vaccine supply to where it's going to be used rather than um, uh, you know, uh, rather than uh, uh, rather than just give everybody a proportionate share. Um, I, one says says uh, a slide whatever showed a lower risk of transmission in Florida, Texas, etc., where vaccines were and are controversial. Um, are they on the road to herd immunity in another one to two years? Well, not necessarily. First of all, we have variants to deal with that may or may not. Um, be as susceptible to naturally acquired immunity uh, from the South African data. Um, but it's, uh, and, you know, I, I think that's going to be a pro uh, potentially a problem going forward. And the other thing is that natural immunity may wane a little bit more rapidly. So I think you only get so much from naturally acquired immunity. Um, can you uh, briefly comment on vaccine side effects? As patients ask a lot, myocarditis, pericarditis seems to be a particular concern of folks around me. Myocarditis and pericarditis are from the um, are, are most pronounced in adolescent older adolescent males. Um, it may be as much as one in forty thousand uh, patients uh, who are fully vaccinated. Um, the, um, um, uh, the the other uh, the other part of this is that the myocarditis is uh, by and large, and by by and large I mean more than eighty percent mild. Um, uh, and recovers with uh, just rest and um, NSAIDs. Uh, so over a period of about six weeks. So uh, yeah, it is a concern. It is something we worry about, uh, but the, it appears that there's um, in the vast majority of patients, there's no lasting harm. Um, for people who are infected previously, is there a strong incentive to still vaccinate, especially now with the new Omicron variant? And if yet, which, which vaccine? Well, Arion. Now there's also some ways to work with ha quite happily. Um, the, uh, the, there are data that say that people who were, uh, who were infected, comparing them to people who were infected then vaccinated, the people in the latter group infection plus vaccination had a much lower risk of reinfection. So those are the direct data that bear on that. So I think the answer is yes, they should get um, vaccinated after they've been infected. Um, I think it's dealer's choice which, uh, which vaccine you want to get. I think that uh, CDC also probably, um, or ACIP, will eventually reconsider uh, the mRNA vaccines about whether you need two of them or whether only one is good enough for revaccination in the face of, of naturally acquired infection. Um, Considering, uh, there's another one, considering there is a thought that J&J &J should have two sh shot series versus one dose, should the Moderna booster be two doses or double the current dose? Uh, well, there is, there is a, there are trials that look at one versus two J&J &J doses. If we'd had those originally, the, the recommendation may have been for, the authorization might have been for two doses uh, of J&J. &J. I don't know that that actually spills over to Moderna and I think people are pretty comfortable with a 50 microgram boosting dose right now. Um, the, this is another question, will vaccines still recognize the mutated spike proteins of the Omicron variant? Yes, there are a number of epitopes. Remember it's 1,273 amino acids long on the spike protein. And um, we think that the, at least there'll be at least partial recognition. Um, Okay, let's see. What are your thoughts on the risk of viral evolution with molnupiravir, uh, especially if the therapeutic course is not completed? Well, with all, as with an all um, antibiotic, including antiviral drugs, yes, you can breed resistance if you do this, um, if you don't uh, manage to kill the virus outright. So that uh, remains a concern. Um, uh, this is a similar thing. Will the virus likely develop resistance to oral antivirals? as influenza has, yeah, it's, in, it's inevitable that it'll happen. 
but you want something that's going to work so well that you're going to kill them outright. Okay. Uh, with waning immunity, this is a good question. With the main waning immunity, at which point will the definition for fully vaccinated change to include booster doses? Um, several people have changed it already, including the University of California system. Uh, and I think it's just, a, if it hasn't happened, uh, it's a matter of time. Okay. Um, what, might, uh, what, might, uh, what might it take to know if Omicron is not so bad for young kids or very old individuals? I think we just have to accumulate case series. Um, as I said, there is this boost in, there's this big bump in South Africa in pediatric vaccinations, at least in some centers, um, and we have to sort out what it is. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, okay, let me just see. So um, why is Sputnik not used in the USA? That's a good question. Um, it works okay, um, but it was, uh, they have the manufacturer hasn't applied for it to be used. That's a real simple reason. Um, if you're interested uh, next week on Wednesday, Dr. Monica Gandhi is doing uh, grand rounds for the Institute for Global Health Sciences at UCSF and is going to discuss the non-US approved uh, vaccines if you're interested. Um, okay, how much do you think the infection numbers are underestimated? Or they're underestimated by 40% uh, based on what we know from, from China. So I think if you're, um, uh, you know, for any uh, estimate of the number of infections, if you're going off of case numbers, you have to uh, something probably a little less than double it. Um, okay. Uh, all right, here's a good one. What do you feel is more effective, uh, more effective as a public health intervention for large group gatherings, mandating vaccine for all attendees or having all uh, participants test within seven days of the event? Uh, I think mandating vaccine is far superior to that. Now, if you'd said within 12 hours of the event, I would have had to think about it. Um, but that's the whole point about the US for the uh, travel reentry trying to squeeze it down from 72 hours to 24 hours is that you'll miss fewer people who are, um, you're just becoming uh, infected, with just becoming symptomatic, which is when they're also shedding max, maximal amounts of virus. Um, do you have any new thoughts on the reason that low-income countries have been spared from severe COVID? Do you think there could be cross protection from exposure to other infections? That's an interesting question. Um, if you think about, start with they haven't really been um, haven't really been spared. Uh, I think that the um, uh, the concern is uh, that there's been underdiagnosis. Um, plus, there's a tremendous youth bubble in Africa, uh, youth bulge in, in demographically in Africa. So the population is much younger than in other parts of the world. So for that reason, we may not have seen the hospitalizations, which might've been the easiest place to capture uh, cases. Uh, I think we need to be a little, um, I think we, we just don't know enough about it uh, yet to, to really work, it, work through it. Okay. Um, For vaccinated and then, la then later infected persons, is there a need to get a booster? I'd say yes. I, I, I think that, um, you know, while you're, um, uh, uh, I, I'm not sure that this, you know, that we're going to be doing anything but chasing um, uh, immunity in, in going into the future. We may get reboosted re again annually or something like that. Um, it needs to be, I think we need to be uh, careful about. Um, telling people that they don't need uh, that they don't need boosting. Okay, and can you better describe? I can't do that. Uh, how about this syndemic? You recommend that people continue the flu vaccines? Yes, I think that's important. Although, as I said, there's not a lot of influenza activity uh, quite yet. And I think um, uh, okay. Um, how often will boosters be necessary? Unknown. I would say, um, uh, you know, I, you could consider annual boosters, but we'll have to see. There, there's a, kind of an open question about whether we should reformulate um, the, uh, the the mRNA vaccines to include Delta and Omicron going forward. Um, that um, have a, you know, so we would have a 
uh, sort of a more contemporary vaccine. Uh, that really hasn't been taken up by ACIP yet, although the manufacturers are talking about it. Okay, why do reports keep providing one dose data on mRNA vaccines when two are necessary? I agree with you there. Um, I think it's, uh, I think basically what we're saying is, um, uh, uh, I, I think what they're saying is that the, the people are intend to get the second dose. It's meant to be kind of a leading edge, yeah, but it's not the correct thing to look at. Um, okay, any sense of how well um, uh, rapid tests work in little kids to inform the ability to do holiday uh, gatherings safely? My impression is that they work pretty well. Um, again, um, you, uh, and I'm basing this on school children. I think preschool children um, and infants are another matter. Um, but I, I think my impression is um, that, they, uh, that the antigen tests work just as well on those kids as they do on others. There's some suggestion that infants actually have higher, higher viral loads if they're infected, uh, which would mean that the tests would be even, uh, perform even better. Uh, okay, uh, let's see if I can pull another one. Do we know the protective, the level of protective titer? How will we know when to boost? Um, we don't know what the protective antibody level is and CDC has a very specific recommendation not to try and chase antibody levels as a, uh, as a decision point for boosting. Um, I think that that's, um, uh, Right, we just it just hasn't been worked out yet, and it may be very different for very different for different people, and it may be different with different uh, variants. So, I'd say that the decision to boost is based on timing, since the second dose and, and nothing else. Okay. Um, all right, I got some here in the chat too. Let me get over to chat line. Uh, okay. Is there, this jumps around so fast. Is there any disease state that should not get the vaccine, i.e. lupus? Um, no, I don't believe so. I, I think that you need to be, these aren't live vaccines um, and they don't, um, they don't replicate in the nucleus. Uh, and I think that they're, you know, something like lupus may be an actual indication for getting, uh, for getting vaccinated. I think you can always talk to the ID people at your, at your uh, institution and get a little bit better sense of that. But to me, nothing jumps out. Okay. Um, okay. Does infection with Omicron produce antibodies effective against Delta or other uh, variants? That's a good question. As I showed you in South Africa, there's, a, there's this modeling study that just came out late last week that suggested that uh, reinfection was more common with Omicron than it had been with prior variants, um, which would mean that people who had been infected with alpha or beta or delta, beta was the big South African variant at one point, with alpha or beta or delta are more prone to reinfection with Omicron than people who'd had alpha or beta were with delta or people that had you know, alpha with beta. So it's, um, there is some indirect evidence about that. Um, you know, I, I think it's, um, uh, I think that's, a, that's an important, um, it's potentially an important point and it's one that's gonna have to evolve here. Okay, so, um, so the, uh, just a, there's a one last question I'll answer. How's the flu season this year so far? What's the vaccine efficacy, efficacy for the flu shot this year? Well, that's easy because nobody knows until the season's over. Um, but there, the flu season so far this year is mild. The flu season in the Southern hemisphere uh, during our summer was also mild. Um, and uh, I think that we given non-pharmaceutical interventions, at least that are relatively widespread, um, that uh, will be in pretty good shape for, um, uh, for, uh, for influenza this year. So by my clock, we're at 11 o'clock. And um, uh, let's see, Jose, anything to, we need to add or Donna? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Rutherford. As a reminder for our audience, evaluations and information on how to claim continuing education credits will be emailed by 5 p.m. Pacific time tomorrow. 
and this will enable us to view all of those that have attended today's live activity. To view upcoming and on-demand ISUSA activities, including other webinars, um, dialogues, and virtual courses, please visit our website. And if you'd like to learn or hear more about the COVID-19 pandemic, um, you may visit our website and um, the on-demand webcast from our dialogue last Friday is available. Again, we'd like to thank our presenter, Dr. Rutherford, and to the audience for your participation. And this concludes today's webinar.